Today I would like to discuss about my studies that I perform at the TH of Zurich as postdoc. And my main interest has been to try to understand the events and the signaling cascades involved in the early step of embryonic development. At this purpose we are using a particular cellular system that are embryonics themselves. And uh, when you're working with uh, this uh, particular cellular model, directly or indirectly, you're trying to address uh, one of the most fascinating questions that we have uh, in uh, developmental biology. That is how, from one single cell, we have the formation of an entire organism. <coughs> If we rewind this uh, developmental movie, every star, everything starts with uh, a fertilized oocyte that we can also call a zygote. The zygote starts to rapidly divide and leads to the formation of a blastocyst. From the blastocyst, and uh, more specifically from the inner cell mass, we can derive our embryonic stem cells. Cells that are characterized by self-renewal and differentiation potential, meaning that from them we can generate all the cells composing our organism. At this point, the blastocyst is able to implant in the mother uterus and uh, its development is guided by the action of different axes, uh, defining the anterior posterior, dorsal ventral and right-left directions. Those axes are coordinated by five signaling cascades that are quite crucial in shaping the embryo development. Today we are going to discuss about one of these uh, cascades, the hedgehog pathway. But before going into the detail of the molecular events of this cascade, I would like to spend a couple of slides to introduce you to a particular cellular system, haploid embryonic stem cells, and how we can use uh, their half genome to efficiently perform genetic screening. More or less uh, 10 years ago, the group of Professor Woods uh, succeeded for the first time uh, to derive haploid mammalian embryonic stem cells. Uh, and they succeeded to do that by chemically activating the oocyte. So the oocyte started to divide without uh, the fecundation with the spermatozo and uh, is able to progress at the level of the blastocyst stage, just amplifying the maternal genome. As uh, I showed before, from uh, the blastocyst, we can derive our embryonic stem cells that uh, at this point will be characterized by half of the amount of chromosomes. So we can use uh, this cellular system, as mentioned before, to perform efficient genetic screening. And uh, the first one that uh, understood uh, the relevance uh, in uh, this kind of loss of function approach uh, to have uh, just uh, one single target to hit uh, instead of two, uh, I'm sorry, I just got confused. So those embryonic stem cells that we are able to derive uh, are still characterized by the same self-renewal and differentiation potential like their dependent counterparts. Uh, and this was nicely demonstrated in the, this experiment in which, uh, in this chimera experiment, in which the injection of embryonic stem cells, coupled embryonic stem cells labeled with the GFP are still able to participate in the formation of the novel organism. And we can also take our haploid embryonic stem cells and differentiate them in multiple lineages, such as neural stem cells, cardiomyocyte, pancreatic cells, still maintaining their haploid genome. So, as uh, I was uh, trying to say before, and I just uh, got confused, so the first one that, that understood the relevance of this uh, uh, having just one single target to eat instead of two in this loss of function approaches has been the Greek poet Homer. Mm -hmm. Try to imagine, in fact, what would have happened to Ulysses if instead Polyphemus would have met a giant with two eyes instead of one. Likely, he would have a couple of more trouble of escaping from uh, the giant cave, and uh, my expectation is that uh, his trouble would have been uh, rather short. If you are introducing a mutation in the mammalian genome, this mutation will be always, in most of the cases, in a heterozygous state. And if the mutation that we are talking about is a loss of function mutation, this means that will be always phenotypically masked by the other allele. 
in uplift cells, instead we are totally bypassing this problem, and any kind of mutation that we are introducing is directly phenotypically exposed. This allows us to perform genetic screening with a resolution not comparable with any kind of uh, other mammalian cellular system. We can take our haploid embryonic stem cells, deeply mutagenize them by different approaches, such as CRISCAS 9 libraries, insertion of mutagenesis, chemical mutagenesis, obtaining like that an extremely complex population of cells in which each cell is characterized by different spectra of mutation. We can take those mutations and select for the phenotype of our interest. In the insertion of mutagenesis, okay, here there was some kind of features. In the insertion of mutagenesis, we are taking advantage of the natural ability of viruses to enter inside the cell and randomly integrate in the host genome. We are using some specific some specific lentivirus uh, mod uh, modified to express our gene trap cassette that is characterized by the presence of a splice acceptor site positioned upstream than a reference gene and a strong polyadelineation signal. The fact that we know the genomic sequence of our viruses allows us to uh, precisely map the site of the integration by next generation sequencing strategies. And as we are going to see later on, this allows us to predict the biological effect of our mutation. Using insertion mutagenesis, we are able to deeply mutagenize the mouse genome. As you can see in this figure, where you see all the chromosomes of the mouse genome and where each red line is an independent integration event. We calculated in this experiment that we uh, hitted our uh, we generated a cell population with more than two millions of insertions in this experiment, and the majority of them are uh, uh, targeting genes. Uh, so, in conclusion, we are able to perform this kind of screening in which uh, transcribed genes uh, are characterized by at least 50 independent integration events. The biological effect of this mutation uh, depends on the orientation of our gene trap cassette. Uh, so if uh, the uh, integration occurs in sense uh, respect to gene transcription, this will lead to a functional knockout because uh, during the splicing process we have the recognition of our splice acceptor and the formation of an alternative transcript variant. Instead, if the integration occurs anti-sense, we are talking about a silent mutation because uh, during the splicing process our gene trap cassette will be just skipped away. This is nicely demonstrated, uh, um, explained in this uh, experiment, in which a group uh, tried to identify novel factors involved in Lassa virus infection. They identified uh, this gene, and in this picture you can see uh, all the mutations identified, like labeled with a dot. We are uh, we having uh, labeled with the red the sense, so the mutagenic mutation, and uh, with the green the neutral ones. As you can see in control libraries, we have an equal distribution between sense and antisense mutations. But after selection, considering that for the survival of these cells we needed to kill the expression of this gene, we have an increase of the mutagenic event, the phenotypic mutagenic event, and a progressive loss of the neutral ones. So this uh, nature of our uh, uh, b-valent activity of our gene trap cassette allow us uh, to analyze the process of selection in the screening using different perspectives. And uh, these different perspectives, uh, these four parameters, uh, allow us to extremely increase the specificity and the sensibility of our analysis. Considering that uh, insertion of mutagenesis uh, by, uh, in haploid cells is a quite recent approach, uh, we had to define by our cell a bioinformatic pipeline for this uh, screening. And uh, like that, we uh, generated this program, HASAPI, that stands for Haploid Screening Analysis Package in Python, that is a quite uh, efficient tool that helps researchers from the early step of uh, next generation sequencing analysis to the final outcome of the screening pipeline, that is actually a list of potential candidates. We already used uh, Upload screening and the SAPI package in a multiple approaches. And today I would like to discuss with you about our most recent paper where we identify novel modulator of the hedgehog cascade. In the 50, a group of researchers in a remote farm in Ohio 
had to deal with a severe case of malformation occurring in a lamb population. After a lot of studies, they understood that those malformations were caused by a plant, uh, Californica veraticum, that was eaten by pregnant sheep. They understood that this plant was containing a teratogenic compound, and due to this kind of malformation that was calling, causing, they call it cyclophamine. We had to wait additional 30 years before the identification of the edge of pathway, and before discovering that aculip cyclophamine is one of the most potent and specific inhibitor of the hedgehog cascade. The hedgehog pathway is quite crucially involved during embryonic development and participates in the formation of many organs of our uh, of the development of the developed organism. And uh, one of the processes in which activity, its activity has been better characterized, is uh, during a neural tube uh, specification. At the level of neural tube, an edge of gradient is quite crucial to define the ventral and the dorsal domain of the neural tube. And according to this gradient, we have the specification of a different neuronal subtypes. Even subtle differences in this gradient leads to severe malformations. We already met the cyclophic lamb. On the other side, so if we have edge of hyperactivation, we have the Janus cat. So a cat characterized by two heads. The edge cascade is characterized by a series of inhibitory steps. And the GPCR smoothen, that is actually also the target of our cyclophamine, it plays a crucial role in this process. Generally, its activity is prevented by the uh, edge receptor patch. But upon edge stimulation, we have a patch repression, and the smoothen is able to promote downstream events, leading at the end activation of the glyphamino transcription factors. Despite intense study, we still don't know how and neither where patch prevents smooth action. There is an hypothesis that this interaction occurs at the level of the primary cilia, and the primary cilia is a particular cellular compartment that we are finding in uh, um, cell of vertebrates, strongly linked in the regulation of a multiple signaling cascade and also in the regulation of the hedgehog part. The actual idea is that the patch localized at the level of the primary cilia prevents smoothened trafficking in this compartment. However, upon edge stimulation, we have degradation of patch, smoothen is able to traffic through the primary cilia and promote a downstream event. However, multiple evidences are starting to accumulate and are starting to suggest that this model is not able to totally explain all the different aspects of hedgehog signaling activation. And we had the possibility to participate to this extremely fascinating debate by the fact that we discovered that puromorphamine, a compound specifically targeting smoothen, is killing our embryonic stem cell. That actually are lacking the primary cilia. So we, uh, this leads us to discover that the smoothen in these cells, in pluripotent stem cells, is quite crucial in preventing dissociation-induced apoptosis. So cells uh, untreated after trypsinization are able to attach, spread, and divide. Cells instead treated with poromorphamine are characterized by a higher motility, are starting to form in blood beings, and at the end die by apoptosis. We can easily rescue the poromorphamine effect using a specific inhibitor of dissociation-induced apoptosis. So we decided to use this phenotype, promorphamine cytotoxicity, to perform a genetic screening to identify novel modulator of the hedgehog cascade. Uh, we took our haploid embryonic stem cell, deeply mutagenized them by insertional mutagenesis, and uh, treated with poromorphamine. Like that, we identified many genes that were characterized by an enrichment of mutation during the process of selection. Among those genes, we identify essentially two main classes, uh, inhibitors of dissociation-induced cell death, that actually represent for us like uh, the positive control of our screening pipeline, and then we identify many factors that uh, have uh, that encode from protein with an ER-GOGI localization. 
and uh, considering that extremely little is known about uh, smooth trafficking in the ARGOG compartment, we decided to focus on the top hit of uh, this list, TIMET 2. In a multiple essay, we uh, verified that, that uh, TIMET 2 is a negative modulator of the hedge cascade. In uh, fibroblast cells, uh, knockdown of TIMET 2 is able to increase uh, glial transcriptional activity. And in uh, spinal organoids uh, that uh, are able to uh, simulate in vitro the patterning events occurring uh, during neural tube specification, you can appreciate that the TIMET 2 depletion is able to strongly increase the expression of uh, these hedgehog dependent markers. We recapitulated also this data in vivo, analyzing uh, neural tube formation in wild type and TIMET 2 knockout embryos. And we verified that in TIMET 2 uh, knockout embryos, we have an expansion of the ventral domains, so the one responsive to hijack signaling, and a repression of the dorsal ones. So at this point, uh, we wanted uh, uh, to understand how TIMET 2 was affecting hijack uh, uh, function. And, uh, First of all, probably it's quite helpful to understand what TIMET 2 is doing in a cell to try to address this question. TIMET 2 is a cargo receptor of the COP1 vesicles, and the COP1 vesicles are quite uh, crucial in the retrograde transport of uh, proteins escaped from the ER. So given this uh, specific localization of TIMET2 and also of the many other uh, um, factors identified in the screening, we decided uh, as a first experiment uh, to precisely map uh, the location of smooth in our cellular system that are actually neurostem cells. And uh, to do that, uh, we used one of the most uh, powerful super resolution techniques available, 3D storm. And uh, with the precision of uh, 50 nanometers, uh, we verified that uh, TIMET 2 and SMUTEN co localize in the Golgi compartment. They are not just in the same place, uh, but they are actually also physically interacting, as you can see in this COEP experiment, in which we pull down a SMUTEN and detect a fraction of TIMET 2 bound to it. <coughs> To be sure that what we are seeing is not an artifact due to smoothen overexpression, uh, we generated also embryonic stem cells in which smoothen is endogenously tagged. And we confirmed by IF that smoothen and TIMET2 also have physiological levels co localized in the Goji compartment. So, how TIMET2 affects smoothen activities? So, in our cellular system, uh, in neurostem cells, uh, smoothen in the absence of edge stimulation have a mainly perinuclear localization. But upon edge stimulation, uh, either by chemicals or using the sonic uh, physiological ligand, we have a rapidly distribution of this pool from uh, internal to external compartments. And uh, I would like that you're focusing your attention on the fact that uh, in TIMET 2 depleted cells, uh, we have already this kind of uh, phenotypic uh, localization of smooth in the absence of hedgehog treatment. We try to put a little of numbers on the, this phenotype, and uh, by 3D storm, we verify that uh, in our cells, uh, in the absence of stimulation, smooth is mainly in the ER, late endosome, and Golgi compound. And uh, that uh, similarly, sonic edge of treatment and TIMET2 depletion uh, cause a, reduce, a reduction of this pole. This mutant is moving at the level of the plasma membrane, as we demonstrated in this uh, uh, biochemical purification assay of just plasma membrane proteins. You can see that the sonic edge of treatment increases the fraction that we have at the plasma membrane and that uh, in TIMET2 depleted cells, we already have the same amount of smoothen in the absence of hedgehog stimulation. So these many similarities that now are starting to accumulate between uh, sonic hedgehog and TIMET2 depletion can be actually explained uh, by one single simple observation, that uh, sonic hedgehog is able to act at the level of uh, TIMET to smooth and complex formation. In this uh, COEP experiment, uh, where we pull down smooth and, and detect the fraction of TIMET2 bound to it, as uh, shown before, we have this interaction in untreated cells, but this interaction is rapidly lost after edge of treatment. 
and these without affecting TMET2 and smoother levels, protein levels, global levels. We believe that this disassemble leads to the secretion of smoothen from the Golgi to external regions. So altogether, those uh, um, data let us to propose a novel model of uh, edgeock pathway activation. In uh, the absence of edgeock stimulation, we suggest that, uh, that smoothen is a trap uh, between the Yara, Golgi and late endosome compartment by interaction with TMET2. Sonic edgeock through a process that uh, we still need to better understand and that likely uh, involves a post-translation or modification of smoothen is able to disrupt this interaction. At this point, smoothen is able to reach the plasma membrane where it promotes gli-dependent and independent activities. This model has an important implication for the hedgehog field that uh, the hedgehog's initiation cannot occur at the level of the primary cilia because we clearly demonstrating that is able to induce an event occurring earlier than a smooth translocation at the level of the plasma membrane. We still have to understand how patch prevents smooth trafficking. But this uh, will be the challenge of uh, Marcus Holter, a PhD student working with me, that uh, decided to focus his attention on uh, two other candidates identified in the screen, BMP1 and TMM41B. And those genes, besides sharing a specific ER localization, they are also sharing a similar activity. They are both lipid scramblings meaning that they are able to modify the lipid composition of a specific ER subdomains. Why this is important? It's important because we already know from previous literature, from previous experiment, that the regulation of smoothen strictly depends on the activity of the interaction with uh, lipid compounds, such, for example, cholesterol. So Marcus already succeeded to verify that either knockout, uh, knockdown of BMP1 and TMF41B is able to promote the transcriptional activity, and this can be nicely explained by the fact that uh, in neurons themselves, the depletion of BMP1 leads to uh, smooth accumulation at the level of the plasma membrane. Even if these data are still at the preliminary stage, that could be quite important for understand how hedgehog signaling is regulated during development, but also during many pathological situations. As you can clearly imagine, a signaling like the hedgehog pathway, so strongly involved in the regulation of cell proliferation, differentiation, and also migration, is also actually quite frequently found deregulated in numerous tumors, such as medulloblastoma. The medulloblastoma is one of the most frequent brain tumor occurring in a pediatric stage. And many evidence suggests that this tumor can be caused by hyperactivation of the hedgehog cascade occurring at the level of neurons themselves. We are in fact frequently finding those tumor mutation uh, inactivating the oncosuppressor patch and SUFU or leading to hyperactivation of uh, the, uh, our protein smoothen. We have also available in clinic some inhibitors of smoothen, but we need to say that their application is quite limited by the fact that they have many, we uh, patients frequently develop drug resistant mechanisms, and also they have many collateral effects, particularly in young patients. So in the field, we definitely have a strong need to find a novel druggable target for developing more effective treatments. And my group would like to participate to this fight with the our haploid embryonic stem cell system model. So I already told you at the beginning that we are able to take our haploid embryonic stem cells and differentiate them to neuronal lineages. And we are able to do that to still maintain a nice haploid population of cells that are expressing typical neural stem cell markers such as PAX6, SOX1, and Mestin. Now the idea is uh, to take our haploid embryonic stem cell and introduce uh, in these cells the oncogenic driver that we are frequently found in medulloblastoma. And uh, just at this point, let them differentiate to neuronal lineages. Like that, we will create uh, neurostem cells that are characterized by hedgehog hyperactivation. 
and that, for many aspects, resemble medulloblastoma precursor cells. We already generated the dose cell lines in haploid and brony stem cells expressing an endogenous hedgehog reporter such that we are always able to monitor hedgehog pathway activation in real time. Uh, we generated the knockout of patch and SUFU by CRISCAS9, deleting uh, crucial regions, and uh, we overexpress in those cells a constitutive active form of smooth and that uh, present a mutation frequently found in tumors. These cells, if they're differentiated, as you can see, if they are wild type, need sonic hedgehog treatment to uh, express these hedgehog dependent markers. Instead, our uh, cells with the, the medulloblastoma drivers are characterized by this marker expression without hedgehog treatment. So we validated clearly our cellular system. Now, our idea is to take those medulloblastoma precursor cells that actually depends on their survival, on hyperactivation of the hedgehog cascade, and deeply mutagenize them by insertion of mutagenesis. Just expanding them, we expected to identify two different types of mutations. Mutations that are enriched during passages, because actually targeting genes crucial for uh, uh, counteracting the progression of our medulloblastoma precursor cells, and instead a second category of genes of a mutation that are lost during passages, because of targeting genes that are essential for the survival of our medulloblastoma precursor models. This uh, second category leads to the identification of uh, synthetic lethality interactions, and uh, this type of interaction are quite helpful for the identification of novel drug targets. Identify something that is enriched in a population is quite easy, we already saw before, but identify something that is lost is a little more complicated. But here comes the power of the outreach genetic screening and the, the particularity of our gene trap cassette. So in uh, um, unselected cells, we are expecting to see an equal distribution between sense and antisense mutations. If we are targeting in the level of uh, negative selecting genes like before, we are expecting a stronger enrichment of the mutagenic events, so the phenotypic mutations, and the progressive loss of the neutral ones. In essential genes, instead we expected the opposite situation. So we are totally losing the phenotypic mutations, the blue one in this case, and we have the permanence of the neutral events. Like that, we can, with an extremely high efficiency, define the essential of all the different medulloblastoma precursor cells that we are analyzed. And the comparison of these different medulloblastoma uh, essential will help us to identify novel ledger pathway modulators. We are also expecting to find some genes that uh, are not actually directly involved in edge of modulation, but uh, that uh, are uh, essential because uh, exposing cells to vulnerability specifically introduced by our oncogenic drivers. These uh, hedgehog independent candidates uh, will be quite important to define, identify medulloblastoma specific targets. And like that, we are hoping to identify better approaches we characterized by a higher specificity and a lower toxicity for uh, the treatment of medulloblastoma. In the last couple of minutes, uh, I would like to uh, briefly uh, discuss uh, about another uh, interesting uh, uh, application of the haploid and brain stem cells uh, for uh, functionally analyze the mammalian genome. So when we are uh, starting a protein structure, meaning that we want to understand the domains and the amino acid crucial for its activity, we are generally using a reverse genetic uh, approach. We are, uh, first of all, uh, looking uh, uh, to some uh, models of this protein structure, and then we are identifying some residues that uh, could be potentially interesting. We then, uh, by site direct mutagenesis, introduce this mutation in our cells, and then we are phenotypically verify if they have an effect on our protein of interest. We can reach exactly the same uh, goal using a totally opposite uh, approach a forward genetic approach. 
meaning that uh, our starting point uh, is the deep mutagenesis of our gene of interest and then uh, the selection of uh, just of the amino acid that are crucial for the activity of this protein. This process uh, that is called uh, protein evolution has been quite intensively used for studying protein structure in a lower organism, such as in bacteria and the yeast. Now, with the haploid embryonic stem cells, we can extend this type of analysis to study mammalian proteins. So, Thea Soniki, master student working with me, uh, is interested to better characterize some subdomains of the patch and smooth gene. And to do that, she will randomly metagenize haploid neural stem cells with our hedgehog reporter. Like that, she will always be able to identify relevant residues just uh, by fax uh, analyzing the expression. Until uh, these cells are maintained in a haploid state, they can go through multiple rounds of mutagenesis uh, and like that we can start to collect uh, all the residues uh, involved in the activity of this protein. For the mutagenesis, we are taking advantage of uh, the CRISCAS9 technology, and uh, particularly we are using a uh, dead Cas9 associated with uh, an uh, uh, hyperactive base editor that is able to promote uh, nucleotide substitution in an un interval of 100 base pair. We can guide the activity of this base editor at the level of the region of our interest, use, uh, generating, designing an array of guide RNAs targeting the domains that we want to study. Like that, we are hoping to identify some residues that have not been identified before, crucial for the activity of patch and smoothen. And uh, this information, uh, together with the uh, uh, already available structure of the proteins, uh, could be quite helpful to understand the mechanism of function of oncogenic mutations and also the mechanism of function of drug that are targeting patch and smoothen. So these are crucial hedgehog uh, modulators. So, in conclusion, uh, my group uh, intended to use uh, in the future uh, the developmental potential of uh, embryonic stem cells uh, to recreate uh, tumor models uh, and use uh, the haploid nature of those cells uh, to me mechanistically dissect uh, by screening approach uh, the process of tumor genesis with the expectation to identify novel drug targets that can help um, the discovery of better therapies for uh, these uh, kind of diseases. I would like to conclude uh, thanking, uh, first of all, the Boot Lab and particularly my supervisor, Professor Anton Boot, that uh, strongly supported me during uh, these years. My lead, uh, for the moment, uh, a job lab with uh, the people that uh, I already mentioned through the presentation. I would like to thank our collaborators, particularly the Novartis, the gene therapy facility of Novartis that is providing us with the lentivirus vector that we are using for insertion of mutagenesis, our sponsor, and uh, naturally all of you for uh, your attention. And now, if there are any kind of questions, I will be more than happy <laughs> to take care of.